when the terrorist attack happened, you were in Moscow, and what what ha- tell us kind of what that whole thing was like. That was really strange. Um, so it was it happened on a Friday night, if I if I recall correctly. And what one thing I noticed was uh, I I was going to look for something in the in the in the store in the mall, and immediately they had shut down all of the large venues, and mm. there was a noticeable security presence very quickly within hours all over the city. That was th- that attack was about thirty kilometers northwest of where I was in the city center. Um, so, and I would have, m- might've gone up, uh, gone up there, uh, to cover it. Um, if I didn't have, uh, a number of other things I needed to get done, uh, the following day, but some of my colleagues did go up, um, to cover it. I think, um, Syrian girl, mm-hmm. she was there. She went, she went to, to, to on site. Um, and, uh, some other RT journalists like Shea Bose, who's an excellent journalist uh, from Ireland. He was up there on site um, as well. But it, it, there was a very eerie feeling because it was a Saturday, Saturday night, the following night. It was like COVID. Yeah. Which, you go downtown, it was empty. Yeah. And they had these images because a lot of the, the billboards are LED now. Um, so they piped in this candle, this kind of solitary candle image that was just appearing all over the city. So like the, the message was clear. Uh, and then Sunday was a day of uh, national day of mourning. So that whole weekend was very somber. Um, mm. And people, I think, were very shocked about it. There's a lot of speculation as to what happened. Um, I did, a, I filed a report for RT International um, as, as just a person who happened to be in Moscow. And uh, I said that um, this has all the hallmarks of a gladio. Operation Gladio style um, uh, attack. Um, so in other words, to amp up the tension. And there is, there is, uh, there is ethnic tension in Russia um, mm-hmm. with regards to immigration into Russia, and a lot of that's economic um, immigra- immigration. So um, perhaps the West is you know, aware of this and felt that they could you know, maybe raise those tensions to create instability. Mm-hmm. I personally think that that attack might have been delayed. It should have happened before the election. Um, in order to dent the confidence uh, in President Putin, um, a lot of other people might probably may, may agree with that as well. Some of the sort of U.S. analysts, I think, have spoken about this. Um, that looked like, based on the evidence and the stuff that's come out since, that that could have very well been the case. But a strategy of tension, overwhelmingly, what's interesting, and this is the part that that I. I noticed was that there was a lot of talk right before that from European uh, leaders and people in Europe saying, we need to negotiate a settlement to this war. Yeah. All that stopped because when you have an escalation like this, then it ramps the tension up. And then so if NATO wants to escalate, that's a perfect way to move towards escalation and away from peace, away from a negotiated settlement. So, and Zelensky also basically put a permanent delay on any election uh, just very shortly after that. So like no more. So they're not going to change course in Kiev. And then the evidence that came out has come out recently um, using sort of ISIS uh, cutouts and all of these things that the the U.S. and Western intelligence have have kept uh, going and grooming in uh, the Caucasus region, uh, Chechen separatist movements, uh, Tajikistan, and some of these actors, the people are cycling through Syria as well, cycling into Ukraine, soldiers of fortune, mercenaries. So you can see there's a lot of cash and a lot of extremists. Uh, yeah. This is a bad combination. When right. You mix these things together. And I think we saw the result of that. So when, when, uh, what did the Russian people after the attack happened, um, well, what was the sentiment? Let me just, because I'm trying to think of if their sentiment changed about the war, because I know there was a lot of pointing the finger at NATO and Ukraine, and maybe they were the ones behind this, and it's very possible. Um, So what was the sentiment of their, you know, I'm wondering if it shifted their attitude at all about the war, if they were thinking one way about the war, and then after that attack, they were thinking another way. No, I think um, if, if anything, it uh, shored up um, solidarity um, against uh, NATO and against the proxy war. And this is the this is the problem when you you're doing attacks into Russia, which Victoria Newland is encouraging, the U.S., NATO are encouraging, the British, 
the Germans or whatever, they're, they're very happy to see Ukraine attacking inside Russia. Mm-hmm. And this terrorist attack, of course, like the Nord Stream pipeline, everyone's saying, oh, it wasn't us, it was ISIS. Okay, fine. But what it does, I think, is the more they do that, um, it, it, it has created a lot of solidarity in Russia. And, and it's, it's consolidated support for Putin and for the Russian state and for the military in the operation that they're doing. And so much so that the attitude that I got from a lot of people was that, well, we don't care how long it takes. Um, We're going to secure our national perimeter. And Mm -hmm. even if it takes us 10 years, we're going to wait and we're going to do it on our schedule. Now, (laughs) Ukraine doesn't have that same schedule. That They have a very short window. Zelensky's window, his fuse is incredibly short. Uh, Biden's window is literally months. Right. And and the same with Britain and everybody in the in the EU. They don't have an unlimited amount of time to, you know, realize whatever objectives that they want to get at militarily or politically. Russia does. And that's that's the difference. Two different timelines there. And it's not it's not in the West favor. It never was from the beginning. And anybody who is like honest and sober uh, assessing the situation would have said that and did say that from the beginning. Uh, including, you know, the Scott Ritters of the world and uh, right. others right. and yourself and, you know, a lot of the independent media. Did you meet a lot of Russians who were against the war? Um, I, I met I met some that were uh, very ambivalent about it. It was just kind of like something that they were, you know, they just kind of had to grin and bear. They don't really, most, most people in, in Moscow um, were not preoccupied with the war. Hmm. Um, it's just not concerned at all. So it's just something that's going on over there. I think uh, it really depends on where you are. Those people who are, you know, engaged in media, in politics, um, maybe in academia, they're more focused on it, more concerned. Most people just want yeah. to get on with their life. However, um, they the recruitment levels um, seem to be very, you know, good. And they're thinking about bringing national service or, you know, some kind of one year or two year mandatory service for certain people that qualify. I mean, if that, if that starts to become a regular thing in Russia, I think then you just have that, it's kind of going to be a cultural shift. Yeah. And much like we had in your France had that up until recently, as did Spain and a number of other. Yeah. Europe. I think if Russia does conscription, they're going to have people losing They're They're not going to, the people are going to be more angry if they're forced to go to war. Yeah, uh, it but, doesn't work out in the in the government's favor. Never a draft or conscription does that work well, out in the government's favor. Well, the thing is, not, the majority of people don't go to the front lines. You know, it's a big country. You're talking, yeah. you're talking. You know how many time zones? Uh, eight time zones or whatever, all the way to Vladivostok. Um, there's a number of different uh, places where they'll be, you know, stationed, and the overwhelming majority will never see the front lines. Yeah, but still, it's just always. Uh, I don't know how much of a boost. I mean, people talk about wanting to do conscription here in the United States, thinking that it would boost morale or that people would, st- but. I don't know. I mean, could you imagine well, the war machine of America? Just, I mean, I'm surprised that the United States, the big war machine, doesn't already have conscription and force us all into war since they're so into it. The, the level of patriotism in a country like Russia is obviously a lot higher overall than, mm-hmm. in, the United, than in the United States. And I'm, I'm talking about patriotism in that, are you willing to go and defend your borders? The U.S. never has had to defend its borders. Well, 9-11 so, yeah. happened, and we saw a huge surge of people suddenly True. go and, and sign up for the military when that happened. I do think True. that Americans would rally if our board, if we truly were under attack, and if we, because 9-11 really did rally the entire country together. I mean, the outcome of that was terrible with invading Iraq and the Patriot Act and whatnot, but the but the event itself and then the effect it had on the American people, I think, really was a rallying national effect. Absolutely. But, you know, we go into all these wars all around the world that have nothing to do with us, and nobody cares about those. We just want those to end. So well, many of us want those to end. Not yeah. everybody, unfortunately. I mean, they, they look at NATO as an existential threat to, you know, to Russia. And a lot yeah. of our, our top intellectuals are talking about breaking up Russia into 10 different regions. Right. And, so, right. you know, when you have your 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 sworn enemies talking about breaking up your country um, and you're, you're not protected by two oceans, 
and two friendly neighbors to the north and the south as the United States is. Um, relatively friendly. <laughs> People say we have an invasion happening at the southern border, so that's one way to get in, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And you've got Justin Trudeau on the north. You know, that's just madness invading. <laughs> right, right. Who knows? Yeah. But, but yeah, it's a different, it's a, it's a different, um, we're geographically blessed. There's no doubt about yes. it that we have a very, um, uh, we have a, a, one of the best geographic situations with mm -hmm. two coasts 